thank you, thank you very much. I'm honored to, to be here today. I I'd like to express my appreciation to the people of Japan for having me and for the, the diet for, for allowing me to, um, to be here today. My background is, uh, is long, um, and I was, uh, I was trained as an engineer and then uh, had a master's degree in engineering. Uh, then I got an uh, operator's license to operate a nuclear power plant. And ultimately, I became a senior vice president in the nuclear industry. All my life, um, I have been working on reactors almost identical to the, uh, the Daiichi units. Uh, I started my career on um, a plant that was identical to Daiichi Unit 1, called Millstone Unit 1. Later in my career, I, I ran a division that built nuclear fuel racks for boiling water reactors exactly like uh, the Daiichi units. A good friend of mine is... Uh, a former Nuclear Regulatory Commission commissioner named Peter Bradford. And, and he told me uh, about one week after the accident at Daiichi, he said, Arnie, all of your life has prepared you for this moment in history. When the accident happened, the very first day, the Friday, um, I knew that a meltdown was in progress. And I wasn't the only one. Uh, experts in, in Europe that I work with, and um, as it turns out, experts within the Nuclear Regulatory Commission knew too. Um, but none of them were sharing what, what we knew to be true with the public. The, um, I told my wife on the day of the accident that it, it, I had seen my government uh, cover up the Three Mile Island accident. And I thought I owed it to the world to make sure that that didn't happen again. I, had, I told my wife that I, I needed to dedicate the rest of my life to making sure that the consequences of this accident were, were chronicled properly, as opposed to um, avoiding, like we did in the United States after Three Mile Island. I would like to express an appreciation before I get into the technical details. I think the, the world owes a debt of gratitude to the um, 1,000 men and women who stayed behind at the Daiichi site and the 1,000 men and women who stayed behind at the Daini site. Um, had they, um, they, they were heroes. They are my heroes. And I, I think their efforts um, uh, save Japan and save the world from a much worse accident. I, I don't feel that way about Tokyo Electric's response at a corporate level or uh, NISA's response, but the people on the site are, are heroes. I think it's interesting that after, um, after the Daiichi accidents, the nuclear industry still believes that the chance of a meltdown is one in a million. Um, I, I teach college math, and if you put a million in the numerator and divide it by 400 nuclear plants, you get the chance of an accident to be about once in every 2,500 years. But yet we know that there's been five nuclear accidents, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and three meltdowns at, at Fukushima Daiichi in 35 years, which means that we know the chance of a meltdown is one in seven years. The, the mentality that is allowing the OE reactor to continue to operate is the mentality that believes in the 2,500 year um, probability. But we know, based on history, that that's not true. What are the lessons that we uh, need to remember from the accident at Fukushima Daiichi? Um, this is a, a, a list, um, and I'd like to spend most of my time on the very first one, which is the Mark I containment, because the problems we're seeing at, at Daiichi Unit 4 now are because it is a Mark I containment design. 
If time permits, I'll cover some of the other lessons that were learned from the Daiichi accident. But I would like to talk uh, for most of my time about this Mark I reactor, especially Unit 4. The, the Mark I reactor um, has been known to be the worst containment and the worst reactor design in the world since 1972. In, there is a, a document uh, on the Fairwinds website, but it's also throughout uh, the, the net, uh, written in 1972 by the American Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And it says that this type of reactor should never have been licensed in the first place. This memo was by um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. At the time, it was called the Atomic Energy Commission. Um, and so it is not a memo by an anti-nuclear activist, but the regulator felt that the Mark I design should never have been licensed. The memo ends with a statement that if we are to cancel the Mark I reactor design now, we will kill nuclear power. And frankly, I don't have the stomach to do that. After 1972, there were a series of modifications to this Mark I containment design. <clears throat> the, uh, the most prominent one is the containment vent. Containments are meant to contain, and a vent is meant to let the radiation out. It always seemed to me to be a conflict that in order to allow the Mark I to continue to operate, we had to vent the containment. Of course, we learned that the vents failed three times at Daiichi 1, uh, Daiichi 2, and Daiichi 3. Um, and yet, in, in America, we continue to operate our reactors believing that the vents will continue to work correctly. So please don't listen to me because I'm from America. We don't have it right. Um, the difference between um, the American reactors and the Daiichi reactors is, is inconsequential. Japan was unlucky, but it's not that your design was any worse than the design in America. About oh, three weeks before the accident, my wife and I were walking through our neighborhood uh, one evening, and she said to me, Where's the next nuclear accident going to be? We, we find a lot of problems. Where is it going to be? I said, I don't know, but I know it will be in a Mark I reactor design. Three days after the accident, a very influential person at the American Nuclear Regulatory Commission said in a taped phone call, the Mark I design is the worst in the world. So. It is not like I am uh, clairvoyant. I, I don't see the future any better than any of the other engineers. The engineers in the world recognized that the Mark I design was a weak design. Um, I happen to be the first one who talked about it publicly. Well, what is it about the Mark I design that, that frightens me and other engineers? And what is it about the Mark I design um, that still has the world um, concern about the uh, Unit 4 uh, reactor. The nuclear containment building is very small on the Mark I design. Inside the nuclear reactor is roughly um, 3 million horses of power. And the nuclear reactor core is only about four meters in diameter and about four meters high. So there's an incredible amount of power in a very small space. So the beauty of nuclear power is that there's um, uh, an enormous amount of power can come from a very small fuel pellet. But of course the danger of nuclear power is that when things go wrong, there, all of that power is in a very small, confined space, and it can do an awful lot of damage very quickly. 
So the NRC memo I told you about from 1972 concerned how small the containment was in comparison to the enormous amount of power that's inside it. But in addition to the small containment, we learned at Daiichi that the top separated. Um, this is like the lid to a pot, and the bolts loosened and under the pressure, and gases leaked out right along the top where it was supposed to form a tight seal. That problem was identified in 1977 at an American nuclear plant when it was tested. We knew for 40 years that the containment would not contain on the Mark I design. In addition to the containment problems is the fuel pool problem, which brings us to the specific issue of the Unit 4 fuel pool at Daiichi 4. In the Mark I design, the nuclear fuel pool is outside of the nuclear containment. There's only a, an iron roof between the nuclear fuel and the atmosphere. When the tsunami hit the uh, Daiichi site, of course the first uh, concerns were about Unit 1, 2, and 3 and the possibility of a meltdown. But the nuclear fuel in Units 1, 2, and 3 was inside the reactor, which was inside the containment. Even though they were both breached, even though both the containment and the reactor were breached in Units 1, 2, and 3, most of the radiation is still inside those buildings. That's not true for Daiichi Unit 4. Daiichi Unit 4 had removed the nuclear fuel from the nuclear reactor and moved it into the nuclear fuel pool. So there was no containment between the nuclear fuel and the atmosphere. You may recall that the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission chairman, a, a man named Gregory Yasko, uh, recommended that Americans evacuate out to 80 kilometers. He made that recommendation not because of the meltdowns on Unit 1, 2, and 3. He made the recommendation to evacuate based on the fear of what was in Unit 4. The Unit 4 fuel pool was exposed to the air and was known to, be, um, to have less than the amount of water it needed. And it was known that that water was not being cooled. Now, in 1996, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, asked Brookhaven National Laboratories to evaluate what would happen if a fuel pool ran dry. Brookhaven National Labs determined that the fuel pool would catch fire and that it would lead to a permanent evacuation out to at least 70 kilometers. The experts had known for more than a decade that should the fuel pool catch fire, um, as many as 186,000 people would get cancer and um, a 70 kilometer circle would be uninhabitable. When I was on CNN uh, during the first week of the accident, I, I said that units one, two, and three were as bad as Chernobyl. But I also said that if Unit 4 were to catch fire, the accident would be much worse than Chernobyl. So it has been since perhaps um, March 16th that the engineers of the world have known that the biggest risk at the Daiichi site is Daiichi 4. This was a, the first picture taken of the fuel pool at Daiichi Unit 4. It was taken on um, April 2nd of uh, 2011. Now, what you're looking at is a cloud of steam and the nuclear fuel racks, which I believe are exposed to air. 
because I built nuclear fuel racks, I can tell that those are nuclear fuel racks, but uh, they are very hard to see. So where is the steam coming from? When a uranium atom splits, 95% of the heat, it comes out immediately. But these pieces that are left behind stay hot, physically hot, for as long as five years. When the tsunami hit, and actually when the earthquake hit, units one, two, and three shut down immediately, which stopped 95% of the heat. But there's nothing on this planet that can stop that 5%. It's a law of nature that those pieces that are left behind have to give off their heat over the next five years. So in unit one, two, and three, that heat was inside the nuclear reactor. But in unit four, all of that heat was outside the nuclear reactor and outside the nuclear reactor containment, exposed directly to the air. The, there's another piece of information that was known to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission before the Daiichi accident. Nuclear fuel is clad in a material called zircaloy. And engineers knew that theoretically, the zircaloy could catch fire. That had never been shown to be true, but we understood as engineers that in theory, the nuclear fuel, if, it, if water was removed, would burn in air. So that picture that I just showed you was taken from, um, uh, from a machine that was about here looking down at the pool. So we knew before the Fukushima Daiichi accident that if there was a fuel pool fire, as many as 186,000 people would die of cancer and that a 70 kilometer circle would be uh, permanently evacuated. But we didn't know if that was, could happen in reality. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ran a test that happened to happen two weeks before the Daiichi accident. The, the test was run by Sandia National Laboratories. And in it, they simulated one nuclear fuel bundle. Nuclear fuel is made of pellets that are about as big as my pinky. And these pellets are stacked in a, in a four meter long rod that's made of zircaloy. And those rods are put into a bundle that has eight rods by eight rods. So we have a bundle that's about as big as the gap between my hands and, and four meters high. So what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did at Sandia Laboratories was they simulated one bundle of nuclear fuel. This was an electric simulation. They didn't use spent nuclear fuel. They used electric resistance heaters like in your toaster. So this was a test that didn't release radiation. The test was designed to see if a nuclear fuel bundle really could burn in air. So in the first slide, this is the top of the nuclear fuel bundle. And this is the length of the nuclear fuel bundle. And that's about four meters high. So this is how the test began. And then the Sandia laboratory turned on the electricity to simulate the nuclear heat. After a few minutes, the bundle began to smoke. After a few minutes more, the bundle began to smoke a lot. You can also see some smoke coming off the top here. After a few minutes more, it began to burn. So we have experimental evidence that if a nuclear fuel bundle is exposed to air, it will burn. So we know from the Brookhaven Laboratory report that 186,000 cancers could be caused. And we know from the Sandia Laboratory report that indeed a nuclear fuel bundle can burn in air. Of course, Daiichi Unit 4 is worse than this because instead of one bundle, 
it has 300 that are very hot and another 600 that also could burn if the, um, um, if the first 300 started to burn. So I hope you can understand how the American Nuclear Regulatory Commission Commissioner um, Yasko um, was so concerned about the condition of Daiichi Unit 4. He knew the fuel could burn in air, and he knew there was not enough water in the fuel pool, and it was only a matter of time. In normal times, there's a cooling system um, that keeps the fuel pool cool. However, engineers never believed that a, uh, a tsunami and earthquake as bad as what hit Daiichi uh, could really occur. So they never designed that cooling system to withstand the same earthquake conditions as the nuclear reactor itself. So where are we today? The condition at Unit 4 today is that there's, there is no roof and the fuel is directly exposed to the atmosphere. In addition, the building has been damaged from the explosions. And in addition, the building has been damaged by the earthquake. At, at about one third of the way up the building, there is a bulge in the wall on three sides. The engineers I work with believe that that bulge is something called a first mode Euler strut buckle. First mode Euler strut buckle. Um, Euler is the name of a famous mathematician. And, and uh, a, a buckle is a bulge. And um, seismic engineers know when they see that type of bulge, it means that the building has buckled from the earthquake. <laughs> so we know that the building has been structurally, uh, structurally damaged from both the explosion and the earthquakes. And Tokyo Electric knows that too, because in uh, July and August of last year, they went in during high radiation conditions and added braces to the bottom of the fuel pool. So Tokyo Electric added braces in here, up and down, because they were concerned about cracking that was, that was seen in the fuel pool. Uh, and they too were concerned that the fuel pool might break. The concerns today are twofold. The first concern is, what if the cooling system breaks? Because a year has transpired since the accident, there's less heat being given off. The cooling system did break in July. Not only one pump, but both pumps failed. And the pool began to heat up at 10 degrees centigrade every day. Uh, that means that within about seven days, the pool would begin to boil. But it would take another week before the fuel began to boil to the point where there was no water in the fuel pool. I think in two weeks' time, Tokyo Electric would have more than enough time to get the cooling system working again. So I think if the cooling system fails, it would be bad, but it wouldn't be catastrophic. The big concern then is what if there's another large earthquake? If there's another large earthquake, uh, it is likely that the pool will crack, and it is likely that the pool will drain. And if that happens, there is nothing that can be done to prevent the fuel from burning. Earthquake energy is measured in something called a gall, G-A-L. The worst earthquake that can happen at Daiichi is about 600 gall. But yet, the building is only designed to withstand about 400 gall. So the concern is that if a Richter 7 were to hit the site, that would have enough energy to crack the pool, and in, in which case the fuel would catch fire, and in which case we would be reliving March 11th all over again. Well, what can be done is the question, and it really 
means that we need to move the fuel out of that nuclear fuel pool as fast as possible. I don't believe Tokyo Electric is moving fast enough. I announced on uh, radio in the United States over a year ago that I thought the solution to this problem would be to build a new building on top of this old building. Tokyo Electric announced that they were going to do just that one year later. So my concern is that time is not on our side. Sooner or later, a large earthquake will come. And the faster the fuel can be removed, the, the safer uh, Japan will be um, when it comes. I live in a world of, of low probability events with high consequences. And I'm not saying that a, a, a Richter 7 is likely to happen tomorrow. But what I am saying is, given the consequences, if it happens, it's imperative to move that fuel as quickly as possible. I understand that Tokyo Electric and, and NISA will be speaking after me. And I, I think a question is, uh, why hasn't this happened faster uh, than it is? And also, why hasn't um, Tokyo Electric considered other alternatives and brought in other experts uh, that could perhaps bring to the table uh, different solutions to a very difficult problem. I'd like to talk about a couple more things now um, that sort of is my summation of um, the Daiichi Unit 4 problem. I think another lesson from uh, the, uh, uh, the Daiichi accident is that um, Mother Nature can um, create damage well beyond what engineers have anticipated. The, the Kasiwazaki uh, Kariwa earthquake is another example of um, something that should only happen once in 20,000 years, in fact happening in 20 years. There are many others, um, but I, I'd like to go on. Um, we know as engineers that these plants um, can be made stronger. We knew that uh, a, a tsunami greater than the four meter tsunami that um, uh, Daiichi was designed to withstand could occur. And the question is, why aren't we designing for a stronger earthquake or a bigger tsunami? And the answer is money. It costs too much to make a nuclear power plant safe enough to withstand the worst that Mother Nature can do. That's an example that doesn't just apply to Daiichi. It applies to the Oe or the Manju or, um, or Anagawa. All of these reactors uh, need to really look at what the worst Mother Nature can do. And then a decision should be made if enough money should be spent to make them strong enough. Another lesson that doesn't just apply to Fukushima Daiichi, but also Daini and, and all the other reactors in the world, is something called the loss of the ultimate heat sink. These are the cooling pumps along the ocean. And here's Daiichi 1, 2, 3, and 4. The cooling pumps that provide water to both the diesels and to the nuclear reactor were destroyed. It doesn't matter if the diesels had been on top of this building. The diesels needed to be cooled by the ocean water, and the ocean water was destroyed. That also applies to OE, to Hamoaka, and, and every other reactor in the country. A lesson from Daiichi that we have not yet learned is how to protect the cooling pumps. This is another picture of the cooling pumps. The, the last thing I'd like to speak about today is the explosion at Unit 3. The, uh, uh, the, this is a time lapse, and the gap between every photo is about two hundredths of one second. This is Unit 1, which has already exploded, Unit 2, Unit 3, and Unit 4. This is the beginning of the explosion at Unit 3. Now, what I did was I measured the size of the building, and knowing the time distance, I could determine how fast 
the flame moved. And I determined that the flame was moving faster than the speed of sound, something engineers call a detonation. Unit 1 did not explode like this. Unit 1 exploded at a slower rate, something engineers call a deflagration. The difference is that a, uh, the Unit 1 explosion really doesn't cause uh, anywhere near as much damage as the Unit 3 explosion. No one knows what caused this explosion, and yet we are allowing a we and considering other reactors to continue to operate again, despite the fact that we know that if this type of explosion occurred at a we or another plant, it would fatally damage the nuclear containment. I'll just shoot through the rest of these slides quickly. Well, that ends my presentation. I would like to, um, uh, to thank you all for listening, and um, I look forward to taking questions. Thank you very much for your speech, Mr. Gunderson, and thank you also for creating a website in Japanese uh, so that um, uh, Japanese, um, like ourselves, can read and learn about um, what you're saying. My uh, concern, my interest, is to eliminate nuclear power plants from Japan, but um, it seems like uh, there is a certain group of people that are saying that there is such a thing as safe nuclear power plants. In your presentation, you suggested that it's possible to build a safe nuclear power plant, but because of the uh, money issue, it would be difficult to do so. When Switzerland moved away from nuclear power uh, because they decided that it's not possible to build um, safe nuclear power economically. Also, there are some uh, movements suggesting that GE is to virtually withdraw from nuclear power. So, is it possible to have uh, safe nuclear uh, power plants um, economically, uh, or is it economically viable to have uh, nuclear power plants that are safe? Thank you for your <coughs> kind words about the Fairwind site. Um, if there are um, um, multilingual speakers here, we, we are desperate for people to um, help us convert the English text into Japanese. So uh, if there's anyone who could volunteer on the contact on our site, um, we, would, we would love to have people take our English text and help us convert it over. To, to your question, um, I believe that nuclear power can be safe, but it can't be inexpensive and safe at the same time. And if the, if the playing field were level and subsidies were taken off the table, we would find that nuclear power is, is too expensive to, uh, uh, to build. We've been trying to get nuclear power right since 1940, the first nuclear reactor. Uh, so we've got over 70 years of, uh, of experience and still um, we haven't been able to develop a safe plant that's also economic. I, I've said that uh, when you have a, a child and they're 20 years old, it's okay if they come back to your home. And, and when they get to 30, it, it's okay if they have bad times to have them back to your home. But when they get to be 70 years old, it's time that they go out and succeed on their own, which, of course, is not happening with nuclear power. So I think there is a place for subsidies um, for, for, for windmills or for um, distributed generation or for solar panels. But at some point, a technology should be um, rigorous enough to stand on its own two feet. And the, the problems at Manju and the problems at, uh, with the recycling plants indicate to me that this technology is always going to need subsidies. So nuclear power can be inexpensive or it can be safe. 
but it can't be both. Thank you. Regarding unit number four, now I understand that it's, uh, quite, it's in a quite dangerous state, but I also understand that at the moment, it is not such that uh, you can take the fuel out uh, readily. So that means I would think uh, you have to reinforce the fuel pool, but um, the way the fuel pool is reinforced, is it enough, or is it strong enough from your point of view? You can begin to remove the fuel in the fuel pool now. There's 600 bundles that are cool enough that they could be removed now. So that means that two-thirds of all of the dangerous material can be removed right now. The remainder needs about another year or a year and a half. Um, but while the other fuel is being moved, it will be getting cooler and cooler. Uh, Tokyo Electric made a mistake when they were <coughs> emptying the nuclear reactor and putting it in the nuclear fuel pool. In America, we would have taken one bundle out and put it in one corner of the fuel pool and another bundle out and put it in another corner of the fuel pool. What Tokyo Electric did was put all the hot bundles together. Uh, we call that um, checkerboarding. But Tokyo Electric can avoid the area that's very hot and remove all of the fuel from the other areas as soon as possible. And when, by the time that process is done, the remainder will be cool enough that it too can be removed. TEPCO is saying that um, the nuclear power plant can withstand up to uh, 6 on the Richter scale, or Shinto 6. And, um, but if you look at what happened with Sumatra, the uh, very strong uh, aftershocks took place 3 years or 5 years after the uh, main earthquake. So you, we cannot rule out the possibility of uh, having an aftershock of uh, 7 on the Richter scale. And um, it, as I read your book, and if the fuel pool is to catch fire, and if you had to throw water on, on top of that, that would make things even worse. And you also say in your book that um, there is no way to stop this, or at least there's no expertise or experience uh, to suggest any way to stop this from happening. But if this is to happen, if this uh, worst case scenario is to happen, and if the fuel, um, sorry, nuclear fuel pool is to collapse, and if the fuel bundles are to start burning, uh, what can we possibly do as like an emergency measure to take? Um, we have to remember that after uh, the Sumatra earthquake, which was a nine, um, 18 months later, there was an 8-4 as an aftershock. On, your other, on the broader question of um, uh, can an earthquake um, great enough to crack the pool occur, I think the answer is yes. Um, I, I, I pray that it will wait for five years before it comes, but I don't know when it will come. So it's important to move as fast as possible. The harder part of your question is, what if it happens before all the fuel is out of the pool? You're right, water will not put out the fire. What will happen is that the zircaloy will split the water, water is H2O, it will take the oxygen, give off hydrogen, and, and cause an explosion. Now, I have been contacted by fire protection engineers who have told me there are chemicals you can put on a pyrophoric fire. Pyro, pyrophoric means um, it, um, uh, water cannot put it out. Um, but there are chemicals that can be used to put on a pyrophoric fire uh, that will put it out. Now, I am, I am not a fire protection engineer, but I think that Tokyo Electric believes it won't happen so therefore is not prepared if it will happen. <laughs> Chemicals could be pre-positioned on site in the unlikely event there is a fire so that they could react if it was. And I don't believe that um, Tokyo Electric's imagination uh, allows them to consider that as possible.